This podcast is sponsored by Allianz Investment Management, LLC, issuer of defined outcome ETFs that give investors a level of risk mitigation to help them navigate current and future markets. As part of the Allianz Group, one of the largest asset management diversified insurance companies in the world, Allianz Investment Management, LLC maintains a long track record of developing and executing risk management strategies across the globe. Investors should consider the investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses carefully before investing. For a prospectus with this and other information, visit AllianceIM.com. Read the prospectus carefully before investing. Funds are distributed by Foresight Fund Services, LLC. Hello, and welcome to Inside ETFs, the podcast where we bring the latest and greatest ETF industry perspectives directly to you through in-depth discussions with key thought leaders from across the ETF marketplace. I'm your host, Douglas Jonas, the head of exchange-traded products at the New York Stock Exchange, the home of ETFs. Now, today I am joined by Michael Aroni. Michael is the chief investment strategist for State Street Global Advisors. He's responsible for expanding State Street's footprint and thought leadership effort through his contributions to the financial news media. He has previously served as the global and EMEA head of portfolio strategy, as well as a senior portfolio manager in the global equity, excuse me, global active quantitative equity group. Michael, thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure, Doug. Thanks for having me. So let's kind of begin at the beginning, if you will, Michael. You know, most people that are listening, the advisors out there, they're probably very familiar, of course, with SPY, but a lot of advisors may not know how large State Street Global Advisors really is. You know, you're certainly the team that brought the very first ETFs to the United States. Uh, you've got the select specter- sectors. I think they're probably reported on by just about every news media every day. But could you give us a bigger picture and an overview about how you think of SSGA? So State Street Global Advisors is one of the largest asset managers in the world with nearly $4 trillion in assets under management. And we cater to institutional clients, uh, corporate defined benefit pension plans, public pension plans, endowment foundation, sovereign wealth, and of course, financial advisors and the ultra high net worth and mass affluent audience. And so we have a more than 40 year history. Now, Doug, as you mentioned, We were the creator of the world's first U.S. ETFs, and SPY is kind of still the the ETF champion. Sectors was certainly an innovation, but we continue to develop ETFs across a wide range. So we were also the first ETF to provide or to bring an ETF backed by a physical commodity back in 2004 with gold and GLD. And of course, over the last number of years, one of the things we've really done is partnered with a lot of different firms to bring innovation to the ETF market. So whether that's with Blackstone or Nuveen for municipals, the World Gold Council, uh, S&P Kensho, to bring products in different categories and continue to innovate uh, along those lines. So now we're north of a trillion dollars in ETF assets and uh, we're excited. It's been another banner year for ETFs and for Spider ETFs in particular. It really has been a banner year. I mean, we look at 2021, the ETF industry just here in the United States crossing $7 trillion this year. So just fantastic numbers as more and more investors adopt the ETF structure versus mutual funds and something we do believe will continue to uh to have some some great uh, tailwinds going into next year. Speaking of which, you know, Michael, here we are. We've just entered December. We're closing out on 2021. Certainly, a lot of broken records, of both on the good side and the bad side. Are there certain lessons you think investors or advisors that are listening that we should look back at 2021 and say, "Hey, here is a lesson that that we've learned that maybe we won't make that mistake again." Well, I think the biggest lesson that investors learned this year was there's a lot of noise out on the peripheral, whether it certainly be with the Delta variant and the subsequent growth scare, some of the volatility around the Biden administration trying to get its fiscal policy agenda passed and some of the volatility we saw with that, whether we're going to taper or not and those types of things. But Doug, what's really interesting is despite all that, at the end of the day, earnings were the primary driver of stock market prices. And so I think here, 
the lesson learned is the good reminder that ultimately these companies' ability to, to have solid earnings and earnings growth has really been the primary driver of, of market returns this year. And I think that's kind of a, a big lesson. Don't get distracted by all this noise and volatility and focus on kind of the metrics here. I, I love that statement. And, and you bring me back in time to my college days. I remember sitting in my early finance classes and a, and a particular professor would continuously put on the board, there's only two things that drive the markets, earnings or perceptions of earnings. And everything he taught that semester focused on one of those two things. And here we are talking about one of them all these years later. You know, as we go into the end of the year, are there ways advisors should be thinking about their portfolios? Should they be uh, adjusting them? Should be they be allocating them a little differently going into the end of 2021 versus other years? Well, first, as advisors know really well, they have that investment policy statement. They have that diversified portfolio that they've worked with their clients on for, with a long-term perspective, discipline, and diversification. So wavering from that too much, I would never recommend. But certainly given the dynamics, we think that the bull case for markets remains pretty strong headed into 2022. So we continue to make progress on exiting the pandemic, albeit it's a little bumpier than we thought, but still headed in that direction. We still have positive support from fiscal and monetary policy. And just like we mentioned a moment ago, earnings are still expected to be pretty good next year. Given the expectation that rates and inflation could continue to drift higher, that will continue to put downward pressure on bonds at a time when the risks are skewed to the downside. So we would still recommend investors be overweight to equities relative to their strategic benchmark, underweight bonds where they could be. And then certainly I know we'll discuss more about some of the nuances in those allocations for sure. Yeah, very, very much so. And, and I want to take it back a comment you made previously about, about variants, you know, and not the fun kind from uh, the Loki series, if you watch any of the Marvel things like my, my children do. Uh, let's talk about the Omicron variant or, or pro, you know, even the next variant. Are, are, should we as investors, should we as advisors be thinking about variants? Are they making you adjust the way you're thinking about recommendations in any way? They're not currently making me think about adjustments to a portfolio. As I said, we have that investment policy statement. We have that diversified portfolio. It's important to keep kind of steady along those things. Now, in terms of the variant, I think we need to know more about Omicron going forward. So, you know, is it containable? Uh, do we get vaccine protection from it? Those types of things. And early signs are pretty good. So currently, I wouldn't do much to alter portfolios in response to new variants or the existing kind of variants from that, from that standpoint. Now, I, I do like to take a step back. The headlines always seem to be, I don't know, so negative. The progress that's been made to kind of defeat COVID-19 has been amazing. So better therapeutics, increased diagnostic testing, vaccine spreading in terms of vaccine progress has been good. We're now vaccinating children. Merck just had their FDA approval for a pill. So that will really help those nations that don't have access to vaccines and low vaccination rates. So despite some of the hiccups along the way, the progress that's been made on COVID-19 has been good. I think it'll continue to get better and actually helps kind of support that bull case for markets next year as well. Let's stay on that topic. Let's stay on that, that growth, right? The, the United States, we just passed a massive infrastructure spending bill. How should investors be thinking about the impact of that bill? It's not only the United States. So $17 trillion has been passed in fiscal policy in response to the pandemic. It's amazing as a result, its percentage relative to global GDP. But let's hone in for a moment on the US. Doug, both you and I remember that the first half of this year from an economic perspective was just unbelievable. And why that was, the 900 billion Consolidated Appropriations Act, and then the nearly $2 trillion American Recovery Plan. And now, November 15th, Biden signed into law the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and Build Back Better made its way through the House. Now, admittedly, it's got a tougher path through the Senate, but my expectation is by the end of this year or early next, we'll have a Build Back Better plan that Biden will sign into law. So you're talking about an additional $3 trillion-ish 
hey, what's a few trillion dollars amongst friends to, to help support the economy? And so I do think that the fiscal policy will be a support in the short term. Now, certainly for all those out there, longer term consequences in terms of deficits, debt, but the potential for interest rates and inflation, but at least in the short term, fiscal policy should continue to support the economy, the labor market, and the, the risk assets as well. So let's stay on that a bit more, right? We're watching the, the equity markets. They, the equity markets have certainly seen dips. I mean, more 1% moves in the last uh, week or so than I think in, um, in modern times we would see usually in a month or two. You know, at, at the same time, while the market will dip, it also seems like we continue to hit new highs. You know, what, what strategy are you sharing with advisors as they start to think about planning for clients heading into 2022? So our 2020 outlook is just about done and dusted. It'll kind of hit the markets next week. And we've titled it Positioning Among the Peaks. Now, I think investors or readers or even you, Doug, might naturally conclude we're talking about a peak in the stock market because, as you mentioned up front, the S&Ps closed at an all-time high 68 times this year. Global equities is close to 60 times. But that's actually not the peak that we are talking about. What we're kind of exploring in our outlook is investors now have to maneuver or navigate peaks or potential peaks. They need to determine this in supply chain disruption, those bottlenecks, whether inflation is in fact, even though Chairman Powell said we need to retire transitory, we still need to figure out is inflation sticking around and for how long and at at what levels. And kind of the other thing that's going to happen is we're starting to get diverging monetary and fiscal policy. So it seems like that coordination amongst you know, governments and, and central banks is also starting to diverge. So these peaks need to be nav- navigated carefully, all the while, while valuations are higher than normal. And so I think it's those kind of elements that we continue to explore and will be challenging as we pivot from 2021 to 2022. Now, you know, the, those that are listening, and if you're not following Michael, you can do so. He, he produces quite a bit of fantastic content. Uh, I know going into this, Michael, as I was preparing, I was reading up on, on your viewpoints going into the end of the year, and I see you consistently have been producing content around three key themes. It seems like key one or theme one is this blend quality with value. Uh, theme two, target real income. And th- Three, and I apologize if I'm not getting this perfectly, uh, this focus on inflation or inflation beneficiaries. Can we can we start to dig now? So I want to start with number one, you know, uh, the idea of blending quality with value. The value trade has been discussed for many years. And, and I, I feel like almost the last couple of years, it's no, no, this, <laughs> this time it's going to be the comeback for value. Is today the opportunity? How, how do you react to that? Well, I think... What's been interesting is that value and many financial advisors and other investors kind of dusted off the recessionary playbook probably about a year ago. So around the presidential election, maybe a little before, maybe a little after. And the idea was that the economy would recover from the pandemic, interest rates and inflation would drift higher, and cyclical investments, which are proxies for value, your energy, your materials, your industrials, your financials, would perform well. And they did up and through March. We got the Delta scare and it kind of threw everything off here. So Doug, I think that, and now we have kind of the new variant scare. So you're seeing some fits and starts. Now we saw some of this from 2003 to 2006 and 2016 to 2018. Now rates were low, but they were drifting higher. So I guess what I'm saying is that I expect that as we continue to see improvement from the pandemic and begin to exit it more cleanly, I think the economy will continue to to surge. I think rates and inflation will drift higher. And as a result, I think that'll continue to flatter that value trade. Those are the types of things. And if it is true that rates and inflation are climbing, remember that will be a headwind for those longer duration growth assets. And many investors, including our financial advisor clients, have sizable weights into those in portfolios, whether they're using active or they're using indexes, just given the size of technology and FANG in particular in some of these benchmarks. Now, number t- item two, right? Theme two is this target real income, which I'll note, you're not saying target income, you're saying target real income. And I think that's probably the key. 
But for someone who needs or wants income in a portfolio, you're an advisor and that's your end client, how do they start to weigh out their fixed income allocation? Because you, you know, on one hand, you have current yields still uh, extremely low. Uh, we're staring at inflation headlines. We're, we're looking at the possibility of a, of a near-term rising rate environment. H- how do we weigh this all out? So the fixed income landscape continues to be the single greatest challenge for our clients and for investors more broadly. And you've highlighted a number of things as to why. So in, yields remain low. U.S. 10-year Treasury yields today, while you are and I are chatting here in early December, are you know, around 1.4%. So they're low, yet there's the potential for them to drift higher. Inflation measures are elevated, you know, depending on whether we're using core, ex volatile stuff or whatever, they're closer to four, five, six percent. So you after inflation, you're getting a negative real yield. And in traditional fixed income, your treasuries, your mortgages, your ag. So this has forced investors to look beyond those measures in fixed income to capture a total return. Uh, And so kind of what's interesting here is that we use fixed income for diversification, preservation, and income, and all those are now challenged. So investors have a few options. They can lengthen maturities to capture income, but with rising rates, that would be painful. They can look to outside the U.S. to emerging market debt and non-U.S. bonds, but the dollar has remained unexpectedly strong and has been a headwind. So what are most doing and what are we suggesting? Allocating to credit. And so you can get a higher yield, one that's at least commensurate or better than the inflation rate in things like junk bonds or senior loans, for example. And some investors have turned to hybrids. So things like preferred stocks, for example, offer very compelling yields compared to investment grade corporate bonds, junk bonds, the ag, and they have lower volatility and less correlation than junk bonds to the equity market. So I think that our investors have to get creative on how they're going to get a total return within their fixed income portfolio. And those are some of the things they've been doing. Okay. So your third theme you have is this inflation beneficiaries. And I I have to share a bit of a a personal story, which is, it seems like uh, I've never heard the, the, any, you know, outside of finance, I've never heard more people talk about uh, supply chains or inflation. And, and, and I, my personal story that I joke is almost anything in my house, if someone says, it's your turn to empty the dishwasher, we, we actually will joke with each other and say, I can't do it because of supply chains, right? I mean, that's, that's the hysteria we've, we've come to. And so it shocks me when you say inflation beneficiary, because I feel like whenever the, the phrase inflation is mentioned, it's a danger. It's, it's a warning sign, right? It's, it's a negative. And then here you are adding a positive with a negative. So, so tell me, what is it you, you see about inflation that's different than the rest? So I think what's interesting here is that our expectation is inflation will remain elevated next year, will remain higher than expected, and perhaps for longer Interestingly enough, Chairman Powell came around to this this thinking as well earlier this week when he said, let's retire the word transitory and suggested as a result of those supply chains that are kind of preventing your children from doing their chores, you know, they might last a little longer. And so the the kind of if that is true, if we hold that true, we need to think about ways we can invest that might help us. And so how does inflation work? Well, right now we know that there are plenty more jobs available then there are workers to fill those jobs. And that's leading to some wage inflation. And so one of the ideas in this, uh, in this side, uh, under this theme, is this idea that um, industries, sectors that have kind of low labor intensity, where they are not as impacted by these rising wage costs, should do pretty well. Well, REITs, natural resource stocks, natural resources, energy fit that bill, and they benefit from inflation as well. Now, Doug, the second thing is, as you mentioned, we looked at inflation over history and we put it into, you know, like we like to joke us us kind of geeks and I'll put you in that quintiles. What do we do? We put in five equal buckets, right? From kind of highest to lowest or whatnot. In kind of benign inflationary environments, you know, two to 3%, stocks do great, no problem. But when inflation gets higher, stocks still do okay. They can do okay. But things like natural resources and REITs do better. So the idea here is that 
investments that can benefit from low labor intensity and that actually do well when inflation is elevated, they might, it might be time to start considering some. It's, it's, uh, it's so interesting to look at the world in, in that lens. And, and speaking of which, you know, I want to talk about the fact that we in the U.S., we tend to be very U.S. focused. I think that's probably any investor in any country. And so for the last few minutes, we focused almost entirely on the U.S., but you cover and have covered the EMEA markets for some time. Some of the largest and fastest growing economies are outside of the U.S. Same kind of theme of being in the headlines, but not always for the right reasons. It seems like China pops up in the headlines quite often right now. Do you look at China? Do you look at some of the emerging markets and say, boy, this is an opportunity? Or do you see some of these headlines as a warning sign and investors, advisors should be thinking about their allocations to, to, you know, to China to emerging a little differently right now? Well, I think, Doug, I think time horizon is important here. So I think for me, in the short term, I'm pretty cautious on emerging markets and China. I think that they've had a, an economic slowdown. They have a zero tolerance policy for COVID. And certainly there's been a, kind of a regulatory crackdown. Now, originally, I thought last November when the Ant IPO was postponed that, you know, this was an isolated event on a particular company that had spread to other tech companies, then education companies property developers. And it seemed like a more kind of policy shift from the Communist Party. So that gave us pause. Now, longer term, I do believe that China presents an opportunity for investors, higher rates of growth. They are pivoting from an export-oriented and a credit-oriented or driven economy to one that's driven more by consumption. And so I do think there's opportunities there, but I do think time horizon is key the short term, I would expect some more volatility. Longer term, if you can withstand that volatility and deal with some of the drawdowns, you might have an opportunity to buy here and at low prices. Now, this is the Inside ETFs conference, and somehow I let our conversation drift away from ETFs. So I want to take us back for a moment. Quite a few ETFs have launched this year. I know at the New York Stock Exchange, I think we're, we're close to 280 ETFs have launched this year. Do you look at uh, the ETF marketplace and, and have a favorite? Is there, is there an ETF out there that, that's your favorite right now? <laughs> well, I actually like SPSM right now, which is the, um, the, spider, the, the spider Portfolio S&P 600 small cap ETF. And why do I like small caps? It fits with that inflation beneficiary um, component. So what's interesting here is that as interest rates and inflation rise, Small caps have a correlation to it. It's kind of interesting historical relationship. And I think that's somewhat counterintuitive. I think many would suggest, okay, large companies with economies of scale and low cost of capital would do better. But really, it's a proxy for the economy rebounding and growing. And that's good for small cap companies. The other thing is, is the last time the Fed tapered, small cap outperformed. And we're about to go through and maybe even an accelerated tapering, which should help. And then finally, small caps are trading at about a 15-year low from a valuation standpoint compared to large caps. Yet, if we look at earnings per share growth forecast, small caps are amongst the highest of any asset class. So I like to buy something when it's cheap with high growth characteristics, and it's got a little bit of a tailwind here on the interest rate and inflation front, if I'm right about that. So that small cap ETF is, is one I like right now. So, so that might be Michael's gift to everyone, I think, uh, as we go into the holiday season. Uh, speaking of which, I, I can't let you go off the podcast without hearing. Do you have or does your family have some, some favorite uh, year-end holiday tradition you guys like to do together? Well, so Christmas Eve was always my favorite. My parents had Christmas Eve at their house for 40 or 50 years. My siblings and I have carried on the tradition a little fire in the fireplace, the Christmas tree, uh, you know, friends and family around, some great food and a few cocktails. Christmas Eve was always my favorite. Of course, the anticipation of Christmas morning and what was under that tree. So uh, it's always been one of my favorite days and, and part of the, of the Christmas holiday for me. That's great. And, and what a wonderful thing that in 2021, we can, we can make all that happen again uh, together. And so I wish you and your family a very, very Merry Christmas and a happy holiday. 
Uh, that is a wrap on this edition of the Inside ETFs podcast. Thank you, Michael, for being here to share your insights. Stay tuned for upcoming episodes featuring thought leaders from across the ETF ecosystem. I'm Douglas Jonas, head of exchange traded funds at the New York Stock Exchange, the home of ETFs. This podcast is sponsored by Allianz Investment Management, LLC, issuer of defined outcome ETFs that give investors a level of risk mitigation to help them navigate current and future markets. As part of the Allianz Group, one of the largest asset management diversified insurance companies in the world, Allianz Investment Management, LLC maintains a long track record of developing and executing risk management strategies across the globe. Investors should consider the investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses carefully before investing. For a prospectus with this and other information, visit AllianceIM.com. Read the prospectus carefully before investing. Funds are distributed by Foresight Fund Services, LLC.